Everybody, we have to start very sharp because our first speaker, which is the keynote speaker, Bertrand de la Chapelle, uh, will give a short introduction about uh, the purpose of the session, how are we, uh, how we get this idea to, to organize such a session. Over to you, Bertrand. Thank you. I'm awfully sorry that I have to, uh, to run because I moderate another session in the same panel. But I wanted, I'm Bertrand de la Chapelle. I've been um, a teacher at the uh, uh, SSIG, at the uh, Summer School on Internet Governance. I've participated in uh, events organized by ISOC, by Diplo. <coughs> and generally speaking, the capacity to develop the understanding of the different challenges that are related to Internet Governance is an extremely important topic. It is great that in the typical Internet manner, different initiatives have emerged spontaneously, bottom-up, by people who were concerned, who wanted to dedicate their energy, their time, their money raising um, capacity to organizing a certain number of programs. The beauty now, and this is why I'm very happy that you are having this uh, workshop today, is that we now have a range of courses, a range of speakers, and also a range of alumni that have participated in the different programs. And from what I understand of the purpose of this session, which I think is very important, is how to work together to develop a comprehensive set of available resources and also to strengthen the network of people who have participated in those programs. I can tell you as an ICANN board member and as a former ambassador uh, in the French government dealing with internet-related issues, how important it is that all the different actors who participate in those processes are correctly informed about the technical dimensions, the legal dimensions, the economic dimensions, and the political dimensions. It is important because in most processes, including at the international level, people dare not ask questions and because they do not ask the questions, they do not have the understanding of what is at stake in the things that they discuss. And so I just want to congratulate uh, all the people who are here on, on the panel and who organized this session because it is a good opportunity at the IGF to explore how in the year to come, with the different initiatives, there can be a greater collaboration and a greater uh, strengthening of the capacity building of all the participants in internet governance processes. A last point is those programs have brought people in from many walks of life, and I recognize some familiar faces in the, in the audience. What is important also is for all of you who have already participated in Diplo programs, in ISOC programs, in um, summer school programs, to also spread the knowledge that you've had, that you've received, and make people aware that those resources are available and that they can use it if they want to get better understanding. I'm sure you will have useful discussions and I'm looking forward to hearing what comes out of this, uh, of this workshop. And now you must excuse me, I will try to do a correct workshop in another, in another room. But thank you very much for, for coming and have a great discussion. So thank you very much, Bertrand, for uh, sharing your value time uh, with our workshop. Um, at the first stage, I want to um, hand over to the panel and uh, ask them to introduce very briefly only three or two sentences what they are, what they do, and what their capacity building uh, provision is they offer. No sh uh, long explanation. Please, uh, we start with uh, Constance. Thank you very much. I'm Constance Baumler, uh, Director of Public Policy at, at the Internet Society. Um, so ISOC has been leading some capacity building activities for since its inception 20 years ago, um, and technical, technical capacity building. And, and recently, we've realized how important it was to um, develop uh, capacity building for policy as well. Uh, so we have... Um, uh, elaborated a hybrid approach um, through a program called the Next Generation Leaders. Um, and I've brought with me today Luca Belli, who's one of our ambassadors participating to this Next Generation Leaders program. 
Um, in, I'll just say very few words about, about this program. The idea is to propose to young individuals from 20 to 40 years old um, an, an opportunity to have exposure, uh, to gain exposure, to gain experience uh, through uh, a series of fellowship programs and the IGF ambassadorship is one of them. We have others. Uh, we have a fellowship program to the OCD Technology Foresight Forum, another one for the World Bank, uh, another one, of course, for the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. And in addition to these fellowship programs, we have developed, in partnership with uh, Diplo Foundation, who, who has brought fantastic experience in this field, um, a comprehensive e-learning program that proposes um, to understand not only the history uh, of the internet, but also provides fundamental knowledge about internet governance, internet technology, and emerging issues. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, I could talk about this program for, for hours. Um, we now have 700, 800 alumni uh, in, in this group. And um, if, if you allow me, um, Luca Belli will, will be speaking for me after, after this because I have another appointment, unfortunately. But thank you very much. <coughs> Good morning. So as Constance was saying, uh, my name is Luca Belli. I am an Isaac ambassador. Uh, I am also an alumnus of the European Summer School on Internet Governance and an alumnus of the NGL program. So I'm collecting a lot of <laughs> programs and I'm collecting a lot of capacity building experiences. So well, uh, today here I, I, I will say a couple of words about the meaning of the Isaac ambassadorship and uh, 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 the doors that can open and uh, the, the surplus value that it represents. And so I look forward to have an enriching discussion with uh, you all. Let me try to follow Sandra's advice to summarize it in three or four tweets, what uh, I'm doing and what Diplo is doing. Uh, my name is Jovan Kurbali. I'm director of Diplo Foundation. I have a training in uh, diplomacy and uh, technology. And I used to be a diplomat of country that disappeared in meantime 20 years ago. And uh, that guided uh, my uh, attempt to create a capacity building combining experience in diplomacy and also information technology. Diplo has been running capacity building for uh, uh, program for the last 10 years uh, with a combination of online training, in situ training, and basically philosophy to adapt to the needs of the institutions and individuals. Although we deal with technology, we deal online, uh, with online learning, we don't believe that much in, uh, in, uh, in uh, omnipotent power of the online learning. We believe in the human relations, in building trust, uh, building emotional environment in which people can learn, which is extremely important. Therefore, this is a bit longer tweet, Sandra. Okay. <laughs> we'll discuss more details about the capacity building later on. Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Matjasic. I come from the country that disappeared 20 years ago. Uh, originally, I'm from the European Youth Forum. The president at the moment, it's an independent, democratic, youth-led platform of youth organizations in Europe, combining international youth organizations of different scope and focus and national youth councils covering the entire Council of Europe a uh, broad uh, definition of Europe. We aim to be the voice of young people at the European level by representing their views, voicing their concerns, catering for their needs and fighting for their rights. We do this by involving our members in the advocacy work that we do and focus on capacity building to empower our members to be able to reach out to even more young people and be empowered to change the society in which they live in. And in line with this, we have also tapped into the internet governance for the last three, four years. We've been present at the Eurodig and IGF, and we also not wanted to be just present ourselves, but we wanted to empower our members to be present. And we created together with them, with four core of them, uh, Youth for Exchange and Understanding, IAG Students Forum, um, European Youth Press, and the uh, Young European Federalists, something called New Media Summer School. We first had that in Belgrade two years ago before the Eurodig. We repeated that this year in Stockholm and for the first time we managed to also be present with uh, almost 20 people at the IGF and we had a short youth event prior to this and I'm going to go more into how we do this later on. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm with the University of Aarhus and um, I'm the uh, chair of the faculty of the summer school on 
internet governance in Meissen. And I'm very happy to see you know, a lot of familiar faces who have been there as, as uh, faculty members or as fellows. Um, the idea of the summer school um, in Meissen um, is a follow-up from the um, um, working group on internet governance where I was a member between 2003 and 2005 and where the academic members of this group realized that it's indeed, you know, uh, a gap that a lot of people doing policy for the internet in particular in governments have no clue what internet governance is because it's very difficult to study internet governance. No academic course, no university offers a course in internet governance because it is a multidisciplinary thing. You can study economy, you can study law, political science or what else, but nobody offers you a course which reflects this multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder phenomenon. And so our conclusion with a lot of other academic friends was if there is no courses available, we have to create it themselves. We did it, you know, with the help of a lot of uh, partners, and I'm very happy to see here RIPE, NCC, VeriSign, also ISOC uh, recently, which uh, gave a helping hand and made this happen. And after six years now, we are moving into the seven years, we have around 200 alumni, and uh, our slogan, Teaching the Internet Governance Leaders of Tomorrow, um, is proved by reality. That means a lot of people, you know, who uh, came to Meissen a couple of years ago are sitting now in various bodies of ICANN or in the MAC or elsewhere. And our other slogan is also important, namely teaching in a multi-stakeholder environment. That means if we select the fellows, we are looking for a balance between people from, with a governmental background, people with a private sector background, people with a background in the technology, and people with a background in the civil society. So that during the week in Meissen, we um, um, enable a multi-stakeholder discussion on the ground so that people in the evening, you know, with a glass beer in the hand, you know, can communicate and share their experiences. And so this um, helps them later, you know, to understand what the multi-stakeholder model is in reality. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, brief introduction. To me, this sounds like a spread university, I would say, and it's probably difficult for newcomers or for people who want to uh, get any capacity building to find their way through all the different programs. And at this stage, I know that Vlada prepared a compendium, and at this stage, I want to hand over uh, to him to explain us more about this. Andra, and I definitely share um, your, uh, your, your positive emotions about getting all these people together at the same table and all these people in the room because these are the ones that have, that have brought up the capacity building. Uh, and there was an idea, I think this is the first uh, session of this kind at the IGF that we really succeeded to merge all the different capacity building programs and fellows in one room to discuss a couple of things. What we want to leave out this room today with is mapping the needs of the capacity building in this new environment, mapping different initiatives that we have that are existing and realizing how all of us, them and you, can help extending capacity building in your countries, in your regions, to the other stakeholders and do more and better. As Sandra mentioned, there is a variety of capacity building initiatives and we can see some of them here and we are missing some. There was a good idea raised back in May during one of the meetings, of MAG meetings in Geneva by the UNDESA and we are happy to have Slava from UNDESA today with us, about making a compendium, a summary. What do we have out of capacity building initiatives within the internet governance area? Try to synchronize all of that and try to push in a sing with a single push. Now, well, I'll leave the floor shortly to Slava. Uh, while he takes the floor, I just mentioned that we preparing for this panel. We used the template that Slava provided earlier to ask capacity building providers to provide short introduction what they do, and we hope to be able to distribute that through UNDESA and IGF so that everyone can know what is there out of capacity building initiatives, out of materials, out of resources, and so on and so forth. So we are building that, that up, and you'll help us, of course. Slava, you can give us a bit more about the background and the idea of the compendium. Okay, thank you very much, uh, um, dear panelists and uh, participants of this workshop. Um, 
My name is Uchak Asov. I am Senior Governance Public Administration Officer from uh, UNDESA New York, and uh, I'm really pleased to be here, especially after this tropical hurricane in New York and have this nice city <laughs> with heaven, warm and sun. Um, let me just uh, brief you about um, uh, some of the initiatives that I would more maybe consider as a uh, knowledge sharing support uh, for the opportunities uh, for the Internet Governance Society and then uh, people who would like to learn more about the Internet Governance. Uh, through the uh, providing them uh, instruments uh, to get more information and to be more um, efficient in terms of the identification, the respective sources. Uh, actually, so that as we learn that a lot of uh, interest in many countries, so that in terms of what is the internet governance, how this internet governance can be applicable to their country and even where the people can be provided more detailed and information and the train on the e-governments related issues. Of course, so that uh, you have heard already, so that this is the various type of the schools and the training centers all around the world. And uh, um, we have the Diplo Academy, we have Wogan, so that have a training program, we have this, so that all of them have the various type of the training programs on the IGF government providing the support and providing the knowledge on the internet governance. However, so that from our experience, you know, sometimes go, go through the Google and to find some details very lengthily and you know that some people playing the trick that information about the, some interesting uh, programs might be somewhere like 2005 and then you don't have time because even the Google demonstrate that normally people look just only first page and very rare they go to the page number. So one of the ideas is just only to give some like a synthesis so where the people just in simply so go to the to go to the website and we have website of the internet governance forum and get the information about what kind of training programs what kind of uh, capacity building assistance they can get from all around the world. Because some of them is also, you know, that including different type of language, different type of the interest, and also so that what we feel also very important is to know and understand with whom and how they can uh, communicate and how they can obtain this information and even to also be provided training. So as a part of this exercise, um, what we did, we sent uh, members of the IGF community a very simple questionnaire, just only the beginning just only to collect the information about what kind of training programs they do have. Uh, we get some response, not really, I would say, the huge one. We got a number of these uh, training institutions all around the world who provide it. On the other hand, uh, I also realized, talking with the pr even private sector, they also mentioned to me that they have some training programs, and I believe so that, that this exercise will also stimulate the private uh, sector to provide the information on the training programs and training activities which are also related to the internet governance. So therefore, um, we believe so that in the nearby future such the option in terms of the knowledge sharing to understand which part of the world, what kind of information and what kind of uh, technical assistance as well as uh, the areas of the training um, support can be obtained will be available uh, for the worldwide community. Thank you, Slava. Um, it, was a, it was a good mapping, and one of the things that we also thought of is basically sharing such a database of different services, of different uh, uh, programs on the IGF web as a single, single place where people can find resources and can find, uh, can find uh, the, the programs to take. Now, I would start the discussion, and I invite all of you, because you have been, you attended some of the courses, some of you attended different programs. I invite all of you to discuss the following thing, and I'll start with, uh, with uh, Peter, um, because you mentioned that, that the youth organization that you are with is thinking about the needs of the young people. How would you outline the needs for capacity building in future related to internet governance? What are the needs, what should we focus on? 
very broad topic, but of course, w we are looking from our, our side, we are focusing on a rights-based approach to new media, that's how we call it. So we're looking at the rights that we are developing or that young people already have in general, and we try to cater for them. Like, if a young person is a volunteer, he or she should have certain rights that match his duties uh, and enable him to be volunteer. The same goes for when we talk about uh, online activities, that young people, when they're online, they need to be aware of their rights. What is important for us in terms of capacity is first and foremost to sensitize in, in this or make them aware of the differences that persist in the online world in comparison to the offline world to inform them about how they can guarantee their rights online to ensure that they have a voice and they can freely express themselves and to basically I think when it comes to internet the main thing that we are claiming is why we need to be present as youth organization is not because internet is a youth issue but because internet touches upon everything and many of those things are related to young people and because we want to enable young people to make informed decisions and focus on their education, also it's important that youth organizations who have a very specific way of dealing with people, for us it's important that it's for, with and by young people. That's why it's a bit different than from other initiatives that we find very important and great. But the difference is that we want young people themselves to be the ones to decide how and what they need. So first and foremost is really to open the space for them. And the main need is related to financial capacity. If you want to be in such a great event as IGF to really feel the spirit of multi-stakeholderism, you need to be physically present. It's great to have remote participation, but you also need to experience it once in order for them to be motivated to be present. So financial capacity of not only youth organization, but of everyone who works on capacity building for youth and others is the first and primary need to cater for, I would say. Um, I would like to ask to give this question to Luca. Luca, you participated in at least two of the programs from the initiators here, and maybe you can as a give us a short idea what were your personal needs to participate in one and the other? So, well, uh, first of all, I totally agree what was, was said before about uh, building human relations and uh, uh, building knowledge, and I think that those are the two of the main uh, instruments to empower people and to empower the uh, main interlocutors that we have on the internet that uh, are especially young people so it is uh, a capacity the, the main uh, purpose of uh, and the main goal of capacity building I is to empowering people that otherwise they wouldn't have the, the opportunity to to have a, this, this kind of experience and to have this uh, this kind of interaction with, with all the other uh, interested stakeholders. So uh, the thing is that uh, capacity building is a, is a wonderful tool to have a, a, a complete uh, multi-stakeholder approach because uh, otherwise uh, there could be a sort of elitist uh, uh, approach, an, an elitist multi-stakeholder approach. So uh, if we want uh, uh, to build uh, a, a truly uh, participatory, a truly democratic uh, approach, uh, it is essential to, to have this kind of initiative as the, the summer school, the NGL program run by ISOC and the ambassadorship that allow uh, people to, to, to learn to meet uh, other stakeholders, to understand what is the multi-stakeholder approach uh, and to put into practice. So that is, I think th those are the, the, the main initi initiatives and, and the, the, their main goal is to empower people that has a, a fundamental role in the dialogue. I, I understand so hard that these are your conclusions after participating in the program, but what I wanted to know is what was your specific need, your personal need to to go to the summer school and to ISOC? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the thing is that uh, I had uh, this yarn for, for, for knowledge. I really wanted to, to understand what was the, uh, the what, what was internet no, uh, governance, what was multi a multi stakeholder approach. Uh, I the first time the first experience I had was the one at in the in the summer school uh, in Meissen. And uh, that was at the very beginning of my of my PhD. Uh, that uh, after I decided to to to, uh, to orientate toward uh, the, the distinction between uh, internet governance and internet regulation, and I really needed uh, to have uh, a full immersion in what was the, the, the multi-stakeholder approach, what was internet governance, and, and to understand to have a practical approach and the theoretical approach at the same time, and to have this uh, kickstart in order to, to, to enter the, 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 the IG world. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I put you out. I see. I see. Jovan raised his hand. Well, uh, just a few comments on the needs for the capacity building. The first is a story from the first day on the, of the IGF at the Diplo boot. We had uh, one of the policemen in charge of the security of the IGF coming to our boot and uh, seeing the book in Russian on internet governance and. Uh, Asking uh, us what is it all about? Uh, it seems there are quite a few people, more than 1,000, moving around discussing some strange issue. He was also puzzled by this uh, strange scene when you enter into conference room, somebody is speaking and you cannot hear anything. He was generally confused. And he asked uh, to explain what is it all about. And I uh, tried with the Vlada's help uh, to explain, uh, to approach it from his angle, from angle of cyber crime. But explain it in Russian. <laughs> That was that was a hard, hard, a hard, a hard sort of stuff. We tried to use a bit of our our uh, uh, knowledge of Russian, but it seems that he understood that there is internet governance angle which is relevant for him, which is cyber crime, cyber security, and this is the first message which should, we should take uh, uh, clearly and carefully. There is a lot of internet governance going on around in cyber security field in field of IPR, in the field of uh, different areas, outside of this uh, meeting room. And we have to communicate to these communities through capacity building. What we explained to him that it's not just enough to arrest somebody who is uh, committing cyber crime. There are human rights perspectives. There are technological aspects, legal and other aspects. Then we have to communicate to different professional communities. Second point. We, and it's based on Diplo's experience of training more than 2,000 people over the last 10 years, we have to put additional and uh, I would say special efforts to build capacities in governments worldwide, among governments officials. With business sector, we are fine. With civil society, more or less. With youth, as, as Peter is doing, uh, explaining, th there are a lot of interesting initiatives. But we need to make a special efforts to build capacities in government institutions. Various ones, star starting from the security sector, IPR sector, culture, information technology, which is more or less covered. And uh, the third point on the needs, uh, needs is related to the need to build capacity in institutions. Most of our focus, and it, is, it, it has been justifiable in the first phase of capacity building, is to train individuals. And we heard a great story from you. I'm sure that there are other stories here. But what is missing, especially in developing countries, is institutional capacity building. Institutions, ministries, civil society, business association that can continuously engage in internet governance. And these are three basically highlights communicate to different professions, train government officials in comprehensive way, and build institutions. Thank you. Um, we have one comment from, from the Caribbean when you mentioned the developing countries. What are the needs? Um, good, good afternoon. I'm from St. Kitts in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, I worked, I've been working in IT for the past 18, 18 19 years. And up until two years ago is when I found out that, that there was a formal discussion taking place on internet governance. That was through a Diplo arranged training session in St. Kitts. So I think one of the key issues is, first of all, awareness that there is a discussion taking place on something called internet governance. Um, I'm an IT professional, and I wasn't aware that there was a discussion taking place on internet governance issues that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first issue, I think, is awareness, building awareness that there is this discussion taking place that we can be involved in. And um, secondly, I think one of the panelists mentioned the issue of resources. Yes, resources will, is a critical issue. Um, to travel from St. Kitts to, the, to Baku, it's a major issue. So resources and also the Ability to take part remotely is, an also, is also another option. I'm, I'm walking, walking from, from Caribbean to Africa, literally, because we have only one microphone. Okay. 
Um, good afternoon. My name is Toela Jere, and I have participated in the ISOC NGL. I have been an ICANN fellow. I have attended Diplo um, courses, and I have also attended the EURASIG. Um, and I am extremely grateful for all those opportunities. I think that the reason why I ended up attending all these different training um, initiatives is that I come from a private sector and an academic background, and I found myself working in a development agency uh, where we were now dealing with issues of ICT development and policy. And people would now come and say, but what are you doing about this and what are you doing about that? And then the question for me was, I don't know what this and that is, and I needed to fully understand the space in which we were working in in order for us to then determine what it was that we could do. And I think that what I would want to say is that we have found that definitely the capacity building aspect of it is very critical. And as Jovan has said, the institutional capacity building in addition to individual capacity building also very critical. But I also want to say that um, coming from a developing country context and, and coming from um, Africa, I think one of the things that we really would like to see with the capacity building initiatives is some kind of localizing and tailoring of the training to the context. And this localizing and tailoring must come about in terms of the content of the training, the location where training is delivered, um, the trainers that are used, um, in a mu as much as recognize that perhaps there is a deficit of capacity on the continent, but we also know that there is some expertise as well. And I think it would be nice to see capacity building approaches that um, do also incorporate uh, local expertise. And then also in terms of the approach, um, because our context is different uh, for a number of reasons in terms of even the infrastructure, in terms of access to technology and so on and so forth, and in terms of just general literacy as well. I think that sometimes the approach also has to be tailored to suit um, our context as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tawela. We have a question from Remote Hub in Cote d'Ivoire. So hello to Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, I feel like at the Eurovision. Um, the questions are, or the comment, the questions, what are the actions of the IGF for capacity building for Africa, precisely for Cote d'Ivoire? So maybe later you can also reflect to that, and all of you. And what are the needs of internet training for young people today? And I guess that will be back to you. But we have another comment here. Um, my name is Chinmayi. I'm an assistant professor of law in India. Uh, I was introduced to, um, so I was very interested in this panel because I'm actually trying to build an internet governance training project for lawyers right now. Um, so the way I came to this was that I did an LLM at the London School of Economics and I had this excellent teacher who taught this course called New Media Regulation, which was essentially internet governance. And when I took the course, I was just sort of um, really struck by how much we leave out when we just study internet law and we don't study it from an inter internet governance perspective. So what I've been doing ever since is that I've been teaching this to lawyers to get them to start thinking about the internet in more ways than purely command control, purely the state says do this and you do it, right? And um, now what I'm trying to do is I realize that this seems to be, I, well, I can't teach all the law students in the country, so I just have like 30 optional course students within my institution. But every time I meet law students elsewhere, I can see since they're young that this is something that they really want to learn and they can see the importance of it. So I'm now trying to build a curriculum that I'll put up online for the moment so that other teachers can pick it up and use it to, to teach inter -governance in their law internet governance in their law schools. And even if they don't, so that students can at least use it to, to read some of the stuff and to watch the videos and learn. Uh, but that's just one aspect of it. Um, so the, the question within this is one that I don't know whether I'm seeing it from a blinkered perspective because I'm a lawyer. Do you feel that there are certain groups of people for whom this is even more crucial in certain ways? Like I was horrified that lawyers don't think of this, of this entire internet world in a more nuanced perspective, partly because I felt like all policy making and legislation drafting, a lot of it involves lawyers. So these are the people that are going to be arguing the cases and that are going to be involved with consul consultations of various drafts of legislation and they're seeing it in a unidimensional way. Two is that there's a separate group of people who we're also trying to get to with little less success. So if, anyone, if any one of you has succeeded in this, I would love some advice. We're trying to get to parliamentarians and to judges and to talk to them about internet governance, but I find that's a little harder because these are people that don't like being told what to do. So um, I'm very curious about how you manage that, and I would really appreciate any advice that you have on that side. 
Um, do you have any uh, special participants or pan panelists do you want to address? Um, yeah, the, the gentleman in the middle. Since you talked about institution, institutions and getting to the government, I think. Okay, so um, I would ask Jovan to answer this question. I would also maybe ask Wolfgang to answer on this because he is also a university professor, so he has both perspectives. And uh, after that, I will conclude and hand over to Henriette because she arrived later uh, to just to... Uh, introduce to uh, her, but first, Jovan, please. Quick answer and the story from reality. We were invited three years ago to address a group of parliamentarians in Malta. Morning sessions, parliamentarian training is a mix of tourism, like all training, and uh, uh, organizer, I, I want to identify what was this parliamentary association, told us out of 20 people, you may have 10 people for the session. And if you get more than 10 people, it's a great success. And we asked just uh, uh, organizer to have all people for five minutes in the room. And we entered the room with a former parliamentarian and politician, Dr. Alex Shibera Strigona, and he told them, guys, in your election campaign, you probably offered e-learning, computers in, uh, everywhere, uh, et cetera, et cetera. For example, you offered, uh, you encouraged your constituency to start e-commerce and somebody start e-business and then we developed the story. He got in trouble and he made a phone call to you and say, okay, you told me during the election campaign that I should start e-business. Now my e-business is in trouble for whatever reason, security domains. I need you to fix the problem. What are you going to do? And they started uh, staring at us. We will call Ministry of Telecommunication. Well, if it is a domain problem, they won't be able to help you. Then, uh, then we started developing the whole story. We had the whole group for two hours listening to that. But the key message is you have to anchor internet governance in the particular context, whether it is national, regional, professional, cultural, and to start from the real needs of those people. Parliamentarians need to be re-elected. This is their, their main concern. If you anchor in internet governance in that story, it will work. Thank you. I can only support what Jovan has just said. You know, the a curriculum for internet governance has to be indeed multidimensional, multidisciplinary, and has to combine theoretical with practical aspects, political with technical aspects. You know, when we drafted the curriculum, so our curriculum is around 60 hours, we said, okay, what, are the, what a fellow has to know after the, the summer school? And, you know, our conclusion was, he has to have a certain theoretical knowledge about the um, um, history, the regimes, the technical protocols and all this. Then he has to have a policy understanding about what the policy of the various stakeholders are, including government and uh, the various other communities. And then he needs a technical understanding. And when we were looking for the lecturers for the faculty members, we, we said the best thing is if the people who do the job tell the others, you know, what the problems are. That means if we come to our third layer, technical management, we have teachers from RIPE who talk about how IP addresses are managed. Chris Buckridge is in the room who was first as a fellow in Meissen and then two, three or four times as a faculty member. If we talk about CCTLD or GTLD management, we are going to very sign or the managers of country code top level domains is that please come and tell the people how this is managed. And so because the, this is really important that you have not abstract people from a theoretical level speaking about the heads and then going down to the real problems and, you know, to, to organize this communication because this is more than sharing knowledge best practices than really transfer knowledge, you know, from an academic perspective to people who has knowledge and says, I give it to you for a certain price or whatever. And this, um, the, the, the final point here is uh, what Turina has said, you know, if we move forward and have similar institutions in Africa, in Asia, or in, in, in Latin America, and so on. You know, the beauty of this layered system we have, theory, policy, and technology is that indeed you have to, meanwhile, 
the knowledge in the region. That means if it comes to IP address management and, and you have a course in Africa, then um, Afrinic should do the job. If you speak about CCTLD management, you have a lot of good CCTLD managers in Africa. They should be invited and they should explain because they understand much better what the special problems of CCTLD management are in, in, a, in an African environment. And in so far, you know, the, it, 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 this layered system allows you all the flexibility to combine the local needs with the global experience. And it's like the beauty of the Internet. It's a network of networks. Everything can be connected with everything, but you have to find the right balance. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, just recognize that Peter has a comment on what uh, Tobela said. Pick up on that because I think it's very important what you mentioned in terms of a tailored approach, in terms of a localized approach. But for me, the main question is, and I'll bring the example from youth organizations, though I think it's applicable to any kind of specific group, is that you really don't focus on individuals that are specialists in something, but you identify what is the main problem, what is the capacity you want to give to a group, and then encourage a setting up of a civil society or a similar organization, in our case youth organizations are there, exactly because we want the young people themselves to be the ones deciding on which element is important to them, and then them themselves teach the others, similar to what Wolfgang was saying, the peer education element comes into play. Is, it's very important because otherwise what we do with all these different capacity when it's focused on an individual I think it's great and I'm not against that but I'm, I'm just pointing out that if we want to reach out to more young people being present or to in general empower more people to be aware of internet governance we need to avoid that it's only those who are doing a PhD or only those who are interested in one specific segment of the internet governance because what we are trying to present is that internet governance is a relevant issue for everyone because it touches upon internet that is for everyone and should be for everyone. So in order for everyone to find themselves in this, we need to really cater for that. So to build the capacity from bottom up that will do that. So, because we also want to empower people who were in these processes to then pass that knowledge on. And we need volunteers afterwards who will work on that. Not any more experts, but we need people who will develop projects that will get funding that will then enable and empower others who might not have the knowledge but just the interest uh, in one segment. So that's really important and key and I agree with you that that needs to happen locally because they know best but it's about exchanging these good practices. Thank you Peter. Um, at this stage I want to welcome Henriette from uh, the Association of Progressive uh, Communication again because she arrived later than others and I want to ask you Henriette to explain very very briefly we asked the panelists to do it in a Twitter manner uh, very briefly uh, what APC is doing in this regard and uh, with you I also want to move forward in our agenda um, and ask the next question to our panel uh, what are they doing in terms of uh, outreach and recruitment and uh, maybe Henriette you can finish your your part uh, mentioning and explaining this as well thank you thank you Sandra um, well I'll, I'll actually also try to respond to Tuwela's question um, um, APC 10 years ago developed a curriculum called ICT policy for civil society and for about four years, we ran this curriculum in French, English, and Spanish um, in, in, in developing countries. And, um, and it was incredibly successful. I mean, in the same way that I think Diplo training has been life-changing for, for, for some individuals, that was as well. And in fact, Alice Munua, from, from now from the government of Kenya, was a part of that process and, and benefited from that and then also drove the training. Um, I actually agree. I just want to respond to the questions before I get back to, to what we do and, and your question. I agree with everything that's been said. You know, and, and I think that, that what we've learned about capacity building in this sector, in ICT policy and internet governance, it's about knowledge, um, but it's also about building experience. And, and it's building um, opportunity to participate. And, and Tuwela, you know, my response to the issue of the localization, and in my experience of doing this kind of capacity building for a long time, it's only when you actually have to write a submission on a draft piece of policy, or, or you are unhappy about something and you're writing a press release, or there's something such as the wicket, which we've all heard about, the international telecommunications review process, and you are forced to read 
pages and pages of boring official language, and you're trying to extract from that, why does it matter, that you really get to that point of, of consolidating your understanding. So, so, I mean, there are different types of capacity building, but I think um, also becoming an active participant and trying to, in your own right, as an individual or as an institution, influence policy. Um, becomes very important as well. And I think it really then consolidates. It's, it's what you've said about rights awareness as well. Um, just in terms of, of uh, what we are doing at the moment, because there's so many other people now like ISOC and, 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 and Diplo, we are currently focusing our capacity building um, around human rights and the internet. And this is because we've identified that, as you've said, there are members of the judiciary that don't understand this. There are human rights organizations who've been doing human rights education and, uh, for a long time, but they don't really understand the internet. And similarly, internet rights and internet uh, policy actors don't really understand human rights mechanisms. So we've been trying to focus that, and we've identified the judiciary as an important constituency, national human rights institutions, international human rights institutions, the media, and human rights defenders. So, so and we are trying to bring uh, all of those groups together. And we do the capacity building, we're developing a, a curriculum, um, but we do it at national level. So that the issues around which you focus this um, is, is very local. So in Pakistan, it's very much focused around issues of blasphemy and how that's defined, and then at a technical level, filtering and how that operates, and then what the legislative frameworks are around that, uh, who makes what decision. Um, I think in terms of, 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 um, of outreach, um, I think that kind of sums that up as well at the moment. On the one hand, we, we really try to bring civil society advocates to the IGF, to other policy making forums, and, and we, we also use the Human Rights Council and the U Universal Periodic Review, which is a, a review of countries' human rights practices. And our methodology is really to reach out to um, people that have concerns, specific concerns, that feel their rights have been violated in some kind of way, but then to, to take them from not just being angry or reacting to actually doing very rational systematic analysis of the of the policies and regulation that it that, that it is that, that that they don't like and to try and identify ways in how they can respond to those um, more effectively um, talking about uh, outreaching to the people and we had a good comment over there that when it comes to the especially the the state officials and the others they're not really eager on on being uh, taught anything and being told, I mean, you know, they, they think they, some of them, they, they know enough. With youngsters, it's probably easier, I guess, because young people want to learn more. But how would you, for instance, and the question goes to Luca and, and Peter, uh, being among the young generations which are trying to build capacities within, within your uh, peers, but also within other um, stakeholders, especially the governments, how would you make them how do you outreach to them and, in a way, force them to, to get into the capacity building to start listening, start discussing in a multi-stakeholder way, but learning from the process? You are here. You have a chance. How would you do that? Thank you. Well, uh, well uh, first of all, I think that is the one million dollar question, because I, I think if, if I knew precisely how to get all the stakeholders together, uh, cooperate in a really harmonious way. I could be the, some policy advisor somewhere, somewhere <laughs> really well paid, but uh, unfortunately I do not have the, the magic recipe to, to the, of multi-stakeholderism. Uh, what I, I think is, is it is essential is to let uh, every stakeholder uh, know that he is a stakeholder. So I think that uh, what we were saying before, empowering uh, youngster, uh, spread, uh, spread knowledge amongst youngster. The, the, the goal, the main goal, is to uh, allow a person to understand that he is an actual stakeholder. So uh, 
on the internet everyone can contribute to the evolution of the internet and everyone should have the duty and the responsibility of contributing to the evolution of the internet and uh, to participate in a, in a, in a common di dialogue and to elaborate to fashion a common approach so uh, you know internet is a sort of uh, of prism that has different facets and every stakeholder can see his uh, favorite facets and understand uh, what are his need and but the, every stakeholder has the need and, and and it should be encouraged to communicate his uh, his standpoint and to share his standpoint standpoint with, with other so i think that the best way to, to to allow and to foster a multi stakeholder dialogue is to uh, uh, participate to some of those initiatives something like the igf and to try to replicate this initiative on a, on a local level and to try to build a network between the, the global initiative and the local initiative to make that interact all together because at the end of the day they are all all everyone is intimately intertwined in the same projects I tend to agree with you but because I also like to disagree with people I'll play the devil's advocate and say that actually I don't think that every person should be or is a stakeholder per se I think we need to clarify that stakeholders, and especially in the multi-stakeholder approach, I think it's great if they would be and aware of them, and some with a specific knowledge as individuals can be. But a young person with a simple interest in it is not necessarily a stakeholder. The ones who represent his views are stakeholders. I know this is a very um, contested view, uh, but of course the civil society is built on that premise. And we as the representatives of youth organizations, we get our legitimacy from the fact that we represent young people who tell their voice to their representatives and they tell me what I have to talk about. Um, it's also about clout. When you're in such a meeting, they will ask you, who are you? Google, Microsoft, company, uh, government, uh, the foundation. Also for Diplo Foundation that is not very respected within this process, they needed to build up their renome. And that's what we are trying to do with the youth organizations. And that's why it's so important for me that we have also, not exclusively, but also meaningful participation of young people where it's not young people showcased as individuals, but it's young people showcased or presented and taking part as representing more than just their own view, but the view of their peers that they have discussed. And that's why I try to focus so much and motivate our member organizations for them to start discussing these things. And it's very difficult. It's not as easy because even when we were discussing our policy paper that we adopted earlier this year on new media and internet governance, many people were reluctant to talk about these issues because they felt internet is something, yeah, we have social media tools, we use them, but they didn't really see what's the policy behind it, what's there to govern. They didn't understand that necessarily, that there is an issue. So of course, in one sense, um, I'm very happy what happened with ACTA this year because that has raised a lot of visibility among young people in particular about the need that they have to be involved in something and there is things going on that they are not aware of. So going back to awareness raising still as a very important element. But then also, I personally, we I'm very much in favor of the multi-stakeholder approach. But in order to be effective and uh, work properly, everybody needs to be empowered and give them the capacity to take part. Um, you need, there's a lot of things going on in this IGF and you need to know even here all of us are agreeing on the same things. We want the same things. But I haven't heard of each and every initiative that exists by now. So we need to see how we can create synergies like Henriette is talking about the same things that we are working on or trying to work on a rights-based approach. So that's great for me that I can then pick up on that. But I would say to directly to what Vlado said, in one sense it's not automatically easy to get young people engaged in this especially not if they're so used to just clicking yes or no to something and liking this, the passage from being an activist online in the sense of liking uh, a statement or retweeting a tweet to actually doing something about it is a very important one. And that's where I think we need others to motivate them, to push them, and organizations who will follow that up. Okay, short comment from the audience, then back to Andriet. Uh, just present yourself quickly when you, when you speak. Hello everybody, I'm Marco from Serbia, coming also from the youth organization that's member of uh, European Youth Forum. And just to come back uh, shortly on this, uh, uh, from all these stakeholders, approaches and, uh, and policy level, when we engage with young people we have realized, even though we are doing a non-formal education already for, uh, for more than 20 years, we have realized that we are missing a bit of 
uh, knowledge in internet things. That's why, for example, we are here. But there, is a, there was a, a small thing that we're missing over there. So besides the knowledge and the skills that we are building on young people, uh, when we do the trainings with them, there is also the part of attitudes. So this is also very important when we approach young people that we work and try to motivate them in the right way so that uh, they have attitude to become activists. Because when young people become activists, they will, uh, they will never let it go without them. This is very important. So when young person become an activist, it, it usually stays activist until the end of uh, life. Thanks. It was just a really quick uh, addition to that. I mean, I, I, I support that completely. I think part of this ecosystem as well of, of real, of, of consolidating your capacity building and beginning to influence policy on issues that matter to you also uh, depends very much on policy making process and I think I see people from Brazil in the audience because I think a very significant case uh, was a recent process in Brazil where a piece of policy that, that has uh, immense impact on the internet was made in a way that, cre that really maximized creating opportunity for participation in this process. And I think that's also, so, so we need to build capacity, but we also need to convince policymakers to give people the opportunity to then exercise that capacity and deepen it by becoming part of policymaking and processes. And it might be interesting to hear some reflections from Brazil, if, if possible. Just a quick reflection. I think uh, Peter opened that extremely important, valuable issue for capacity building and for overall internet governance space. It is related to uh, overuse of certain specific terminology. And if you go out of this circle, and if we tell people that we are involved in multi-stakeholder process, we will get at the best uh, sort of a strange, strange, strange look. Somebody will ask for the, uh, is it Argentinian stake or some other stake? But uh, there is a problem of the tunnel vision and terminology, which is in a way uh, insular, and our main aim, and you know uh, at Diplo we have been drawing a lot, we have been trying to communicate, is to communicate what is happening in internet governance in simple and plain language related to people uh, concrete needs, whether they are parliamentarians, youth, or somebody else. And it is very important for the one simple reason. By uh, just repeating a uh, slogan about multi-stakeholderism, we are risking of inflating the term and reducing its value. And multi-stakeholderism in internet governance is valuable because it, it has created a solid policy framework. It supported the robust development of the robust internet. There are some weaknesses. We are aware of those weaknesses. But we have to be very careful in preserving multi-stakeholderism in the smart and uh, proper way, not by converting to the, to preaching to convert it in a way, but explaining it to the people outside this circle. Youth Forum, policemen who came to our booth uh, yesterday, um, uh, a parliamentarian, uh, judge, uh, uh, maybe in three or two or three years we'll have uh, people who are uh, serving the lunch around, interested in the concrete issues on the Facebook or Twitter. This is the way and this is a huge challenge and I see it as a risk, not only for capacity building, which we are discussing here, but also for IGF and overall internet governance process, which is in many respects very unique. Thank you, Peter, for bringing this issue. Um, thank you. I want to give back uh, Ariad's question to the audience. Is there somebody from Brazil who would like to answer on Ariad's question? Uh, thank you, Ariad. Uh, not answering, but just to, to make some, uh, uh, maybe some explanations of the, the situation in Brazil. We, we had set up for, for since 95 uh, a, a committee. This committee has 21 members. Some members are elected uh, directly from the constituencies. Uh, 12 of these members are elected from civil society constituencies. And nine are, uh, are uh, indicated by the government. Then we are 21 members. And uh, th this is a, a multi-stakeholder body with people from academia, people from private sector, pre people from, from third sector and uh, NGOs. 
And uh, uh, one, one work we have done this, this last two or three years was to establish a set of concepts that we think we have to defend in order to protect the internet against uh, sometimes uh, legislation bad uh, formulated or with good intentions but with uh, side effects uh, that can be very uh, uh, bad for, for the internet as a whole. Then we established these 10 uh, uh, principles. And now, exactly today, they are trying to pass uh, a law in the, the Brazilian Congress to that in some way mirroring these concepts and giving uh, uh, first uh, uh, rights and, and, and concepts. And after that, if necessary, uh, laws uh, against the cyber crimes or so. We think that the, the right order of doing things is first to establish the ground uh, over that ground will we have eventually new legislation about uh, uh, cyber activities or so. Then maybe we will have luck here and, uh, look and see this new law appro approved in the Congress this day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pick off one of the uh, uh, comments Henriette made, that institutions should allow the participant to exercise what they experienced. And I think with ex experienced, you mean uh, they experienced to learn in a multi-stakeholder environment and to uh, get aware that they are part of such a system. This was actually uh, a straight way to, uh, to move forward our agenda. Because the question, um, one of the main questions of this session is how can we create a strong network among all these different capacity building provisions? Isaac mentioned 700 fellows. Um, Jovan has 2,000 fellows per year. The summer s uh, New Media Summer School is uh, uh, operating since two years. The Summer School on Internet Governance is operating uh, as well as the South School since uh, seven years. So they are, this, is, this is such a great network and we should be all aware of that these people are the future leaders and they will develop the internet further. And I think we could all agree on that uh, the promotion of the multi-stakeholder model is the key message of all of these capacity building provisions. So my question to the audience and to the panelists is how can we create a strong network how can we strengthen uh, those participants to promote this idea also in countries, in countries and in regions where the multi-stakeholder model is, is not very much uh, uh, lived and, and very much in favor with the government? Um, can I uh, ask this question to, to Henriette, to you please, because you started with this uh, point. Um. I think it really is, it, it is, um, well, firstly, I think there are, d as I think you've probably discussed, there are different types of, of, of capacity building support. So I think the work that ISOC and Diplo, for example, does is very different from what APC and you do, where we act more as intermediaries who support advocacy, and I think we need all of that. I think a good opportunity of that is well, building relationships. I think building relationships with uh, with institutions, respectful relationships with governments, for example. I think, I think, um, and often to often sometimes you need to decide uh, to s to start the process with something contentious, like like ACTA, for example. But in in developing countries, there are often issues that are of common concern, like access, for example. We are currently my organisation is doing capacity building around digital migration issues. And, 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 and that is of a concern for regulators and for governments. It's also a concern for broadcasters. Some of those bro broadcasters are community broadcasters. Some are national broadcasters. And it's also of a concern for the internet community because in Africa in particular, but also in other developing countries, the, the digital migration process gives us the opportunity for increasing the access, uh, uh, decreasing the access gap. And then you also have very powerful commercial interests, the mobile operators who want to take all the release spectrum for themselves because they say they will roll out 4G internet services. And what we find is that if you use an issue like that where there are differing political interests, but still a common concern to come up with a solution that works, 
um, and you do some analysis. So I think that's the first thing. You need partnerships between the researchers and the policy analysts and between um, organizations that do capacity building and between the advocates and the actors, be they the, the broadcasters uh, in this case or, or the, um, the, the, um, the internet sector. And, and it's really, it, it's trying to get a process together where you have multi-stakeholder spaces where they analyze these problems and then begin to try and influence. And, and I think the important thing, I agree completely with what Jovan said. I think one, your starting assumption with this type of multi-stakeholder process and capacity building should always be that everyone is not necessarily going to agree. So I think another area is to put the politics back into the process. I think, I think there are different interests and there will sometimes be conflicts. And in a way, that's another big milestone. I think if in your capacity building and in your learning as an internet user or as an institution, to come to terms with the fact that part of what you have to do to consolidate your learning and to be influential is to accept that sometimes there'll be differences of opinion. So I'm not sure I'm answering it specifically, but I, I really do think that, that the, the, the policy analysts and the research community and the think tank community is extremely important because it's a very complex terrain. And, and I think those of us that do capacity building and advocacy need to rely um, um, on those a lot. But help them to simplify the analysis, I think to make it also accessible. Hi, uh, Chris Buckridge from the RIPEN CC. Um, I wanted to just build on something Henriette said uh, just, just before about building relationships. One of the things that we're, RIPEN CC is doing a lot of in terms of capacity building um, is something we, we call the IPv6 Roadshow. And it's, I think, uh, different to a lot of the projects we're talking about here in that it's really very technical. It's um, us connecting pe experts in the technical community with network operators who work for the public sector, um, basically who operate networks for governments um, in the Middle East at this point. We're looking at taking it to other regions. But I think even, even in that context where it is a very technical um, course, and maybe the course itself isn't sort of going into a lot of internet governance issues, just the fact that we've reached out there to the public sector with the expertise that we have has helped build a relationship there with, with the government, has helped build a relationship between the technical community and the government so that we understand better the issues that they're coming into forums like the ITU or the IGF with. They understand better the perspective that we're coming from. Um, so I think it can be useful there even if the capacity building itself isn't about, about internet governance. Um, yeah, thank you. I think uh, learning in a multi-stakeholder environment means you have to understand the role of s uh, the individual stakeholder. Uh, and there are differences, you know, if you are in the private sector, it's different from if you are in the technical community or if you are in a government or if you're in a civil society organization or somewhere else. I think the challenge is really that you strengthen your profile as a stakeholder in one group and at the same time you open your eyes to understand better, you know, what the problems and the needs of the other stakeholders are. What Chris just described, I think, is a perfect illustration of what is needed. So that means the technical community cannot substitute the governments, and the governments cannot substitute the technical community. But if they do not talk to each other, you know, within their decision-making capacities, they risk to make big mistakes because they do not understand what are the concerns of the other stakeholders are. That means if you promote a dialogue, then, you know, both stakeholder groups, if they make their decisions, you know, within their mandate, you know, are much more aware, you know, where the risks are for certain decisions. And that's why is, um, this is like a double strategy. You have to strengthen your profile as a member of a stakeholder group so that you are the expert in this field. And at the same time, you have to broaden your understanding what are the concerns and the problems and the needs and the pressures in the other stakeholder groups. I think this means learning in a multi-stakeholder environment. It makes no sense if you try to be all the heads of all the four stakeholders. So this is really then wishy-washy and nothing comes out from it. So that, that's why you, you have to make this uh, differentiation. I can only second what Wolfgang said and I would build on that by saying that what could be a direct solution or answer at this point is to simply 
have some sort of a coalition or network or better in touch among those of us who are working on the different types of capacity. That's a first start. I agree with you that we need to all, everybody wants to strengthen their own part and everybody also needs to have the visibility that, cling, that links to that in order to get the funding that we need for the different types of programs. But there's also a challenge and I think maybe in our case it's a more particular challenge that as uh, we are a policy and advocacy platform as such and we need to focus what our 97 members say is the most important thing and at the moment less than one third thinks that internet governance is the most important thing. So which means that I need to focus on using the strategic priority of empowering our members, which we have there, to ensure that they are going to be the ones who are going to drive the process. So I need to empower them with the capacity that we can do. We can open spaces to them because we are the European New Forum and we are the interlocutor with the European Commission, with the Council of Europe. We have a certain standing because we are representing the voice of youth in those areas and we can translate that into other areas. We talked to Commissioner Cruz's cabinet and we tried to push that one of her angels uh, on these issues would be a young person that is actually coming from our field. So that's where we can directly try and influence, but I'm expecting that our member organizations will be the one who will feel empowered and be part of the network and we will simply assist them in that. I think because we are, most of us are networks in on some way, we have also members locally that do these things. So Diplo is doing one thing, but then Diplo per people in uh, Latin America are, are focusing maybe on different things. So I think if we start up at this level between us with a simple contact and better contact after this uh, on these issues, and then we see where we can take it further. Um, before uh, Jovan can speak, we have a comment from the audience. Hello, my, my name is Victor. I, uh, you were mentioning the um, case where you know internet governance do, uh, does not exist. I come from Hungary and uh, we don't have this uh, kind of exchange and dialogue. But I had, had the honor to participate uh, since April in a media seminar. Then I applied for the Eurodig uh, summer school, the Web of Tomorrow. Uh, I gained so many contacts and and uh, you know just opened my mind and uh, I've seen that. Um, internet is really um, providing so many topics that uh, everyone is affected, not just uh, as single uh, user but as citizen because the digi digital age, the di digital citizenship is, is re really extending our normal way of citizenship. So what I've done and um, I'm doing also here, uh, also applied for the Web of Tomorrow at the IGF, uh, so we had also a conference in Budapest, the Cyberspace Conference, which is some kind of IGF driven by governments. Uh, it was started last year, it's very, very international, and I was there as a youth forum facilitator. So uh, what I try to think about is how to start this discussion in my country, you know? I, I took all the contact, and uh, now I try also to link things and invite the young people, decision makers, from Hungary, from the European Parliament, uh, to connect uh, things like the UNESCO has this Internet uh, Privacy and Freedom of Expression report. Let's talk to the UNESCO National, the Hungarian Committee. Let's 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 uh, take this action. The government is there with a proposal on internet blocking. Um, we use the internet uh, to a very much uh, big extent. Uh, we have six and a half million users in Hungary but we don't think about it and we should think about it and that's the thing that I gained through this, all these uh, capacity building uh, projects which I'm very happy to uh, have participated in uh, that um, we have to think about, not just use it. And, and, and other people, if they, they see uh, how they are affected because they, they are not aware of this, uh, you know, some people use the same login for Facebook account that they have the, G the, the email account uh, even those things are very simple, but um, um, there are many things we can connect. And therefore, uh, I really appreciate that uh, that you are also having an exchange and all these capacity building projects because when we are very interested in, in this to evaluate and to implement in, in, in our countries. Thank you. Uh, just one question for Victor. Victor, if you don't mind. Uh, did you attend the cyberspace c uh, conference in, uh, in Budapest? Yes, yes. That's, that's, that's important. How visible was that conference in the uh, Hungarian um, environment? Uh, it's interesting because it was uh, my feeling like it's uh, the most secure place in the world uh, these two <laughs> days, uh, this Budapest uh, Billionaire Park. Uh, 
Hungary was just the host. The whole foreign ministry was there, you know, organizing everything. Um, there was a youth forum, which was very good to involve Hungarian and also international young people to discuss the same topics that the government uh, and international organizations discussed, and we came up with proposals, direct proposals, okay. according participation, jobs, internet, uh, hate speech, uh, all kind of things, which was very good, but very limited time. Well, Hungary, there were some, uh, you know, some some broadcasting on, on internet and on, on TV, but uh, I, I went to the foreign minister, like, you know, you just made the final speech of uh, the cyberspace conference. Uh, would you support to have an internet governance dialogue in my country? Because like that's the best way, way to you know to pick up this topic. And he said yes. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let's talk with your colleagues and let's work on it. Um, and um, and that's the way. And um, I hope it will it will come up. And I also sent information to the media. And uh, they are you know, not not easy to get, but this government proposal on internet blocking and all these issues, the IGF, I'm here. Uh, I also made an interview last weekend for the Hungarian National Radio. So uh, we created a group of uh, um, the internet belongs to everyone group. Um, and I, 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 I have their young people, member of the parliament as mentioned, to be able to discuss these things because uh, it's so hard to, uh, to implement, to translate on the national level, but we, we can do it. We, we need you, we, we all need all these programs and issues. I have a Hong Kong uh, example from the a dot Asia uh, funded programs. There's so many good things. We just have to yeah. rethink and, and implement, and, and that's, that's my goal. I ask this question on purpose because very often uh, we cannot connect the dots, and it's, it's good that you connected the dots, but we, we hear very often examples of big events held in the country and the IG community didn't realize, either from the title, because internet governance wasn't mentioned, but when you look through the program, you realize that internet governance was discussed. Therefore, it's a good, problem, uh, good example that you managed to use this event to, to foster the connecting of the dots on the national level. And as Markus Kummer always says, good internet governance starts at home. So feel encouraged and you know, do outreach and you will have enough of friends who will help you. Wh which brings us to the, to the uh, remote panelist uh, uh, comment, which is absolutely in line with what you mentioned, Wolfgang. Uh, uh, Redona Kaimaku from Albania says, it was mentioned that raising awareness is the key step to start building capacity. What would be a good act to start raising awareness in a developing country? So how to start? How to start? I think start with the issue that really matters. You know, in Africa, we started with access because affordable access matters to us. In Pakistan, access is not an issue, but censorship is. So, you know, I, I, I think f what are the issues in Albania? Um, that really matter. And I think it's not necessarily the same issue that matters to civil society, that matters to government, to business, as Wolfgang said. But if you've got a sense of that, that gives you, was it Albania? <laughs> then that gives you a good place to do the analysis, what policy exists, what are the national, regional, global layers, and um, how should it be changed? And are there opportunities to, to change? Um. Andretta is right, it's about issues, but the internet is primarily about people. And if you want to start a process, bring three of your friends together, go to a nice place and start discussing. And then if all of the three friends, you know, invite another three friends and say, here we have an issue, and you organize a meeting of 15 people. And then you say, okay, do we have a problem? What is our problem? And then you build a network of people. The internet is not only a network of computers. The internet is a network of people, and this makes it a strength. So that means connect people. This is important. Just one quick comment. I'm, um, I somehow I'm not concerned about making people interested. Because uh, whenever we go, uh, we, we, we find interest. It's, it's, it's a cool. It's internet, politics, uh, law, uh, decision making. Uh, it's one of the rare spaces where ordinary people can get into the high politics, whatever, whatever, whatever it means. Therefore, I don't see that as a major problem. I see the other problem. It is the perception of internet governance as a sprint. And internet governance, if I can use this metaphor, is marathon. 
we see it as a cool sprint that we just uh, get involved, get excited, we run it. And what, what is the real experience from internet governance is you need a stamina, institutional, individual, and you have to sustain efforts. And it brings me back to the, Sandra, your question, how to uh, cooperate. I think there is a huge, huge need. And uh, me personally, I cannot run the marathon. I cannot run uh, 200 meters in these days. But uh, if uh, all of us try, uh, we, may, we may succeed in that. And this, there, is, there is a need. There is a lot of possibility for win-win solutions. Obviously, there are problems of fighti fighting sometimes for the same funding. This is reality. But I think if you put uh, the approach, need-based approach, in the proper context, I think that our donors and supporters will see uh, the cause in supporting this win-win approach and multiplying on investment in the processes, not, uh, not doubling the investment in the different, different programs. Well, we need a bit of a, bit of a, a visionary approach. I will just an illustration about the need for training. We did analysis, very quick analysis, of the need for the MA in internet governance in Europe. And our estimate is, based on that analysis, very uh, sort of a restrictive estimate, is that there is a need for seven to 10 MA programs in internet governance and policy currently. Therefore, seven to 10 MA programs on the European University could be easily filled in the field of internet governance and policy. And there, is, there are a few, we started uh, this year in Malta, first uh, MA in internet governance and contemporary diplomacy but the uh, uh, needs are huge. And uh, we are discussing during the IGF uh, uh, formation of consortium involving more or less these partners on this table and uh, quite a few partners to create pan-European uh, uh, MA in internet governance and hopefully have, uh, have uh, similar programs in, uh, soon in uh, Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America and other continents. There is a need because internet governance is becoming more professional and people need some sort of professional accreditation to join the process, not like seven or eight years ago when it was enough to be aware of the internet governance. But there is that element which we are noticing, some sort of professionalization of internet governance uh, debate. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nikola Božić. Uh, I'm coming uh, from Serbia. I just wanted to, to mention uh, two remarks. One remark is... Uh, maybe answer to the question from Albania. Uh, if we want to do capacity building, we, we need to have capacities to build. So education is uh, the basic point uh, for, for, for anything we want, want to do. So uh, also, that's, uh, that's the comment to, to Peter. It's a very nice uh, point uh, about youth. It's not necessary to have all youth involved in this process, like you don't have all youth involved in human rights process or any other process in the world. So if you have interested people to be involved, we should give them, them opportunity to be involved. But it is very important that all of us that are working on capacity buildings uh, think about education and programs that uh, are explaining uh, to every citizens on the planet what we are doing and what's, uh, what is the point with internet and, and the problems on internet. So if we have educated people, we will uh, uh, have a good starting point for capacity buildings. Thank you. Can I just uh, answer to the, to the, to the comment? Uh, well, uh, to com coming back to what I was uh, saying before about uh, the fact that every individual is, could be a stakeholder, uh, I think it is important to understand that every, every individual is a potential stakeholder. Uh, maybe I wasn't speaking my mind in a really clear where before, way before, but uh, it is not, I wasn't arguing that every single individual in the world should uh, participate at the main time in elaborating policies. I was just saying that every uh, individual has the right to understand that he is a potential stakeholder, that he is holding a stake, and he, he has the right to, to contribute to fashion the future of the Internet.
thank you, Luca. Um, at this stage, I would like to ask, because we are reaching nearly the end of our session, uh, every uh, panelist for a last small remark, and then Vlada and I, we will uh, continue the session and, and make a conclusion. Wolfgang, maybe you can start first. And can I, can I channel the question, how to cooperate? How do we all cooperate to, to be better? You know, move forward how um, Jovan has proposed. This is an opportunity for win-win situation. Just let's do it. Yeah, I already said on this before, so I'll just comment on what Nicola was saying, that media digital literacy is a very important topic for us because we need to... Internet governance is very broad and has a lot of different aspects, but sometimes, especially for young people, they simply need the basics to understand how you can behave online. So that's one of the areas that we are focusing on and it's one of the areas we try to build capacity on and then everything else will follow from that. So not necessarily on MA because that's a great thing and I agree with that, but simply from the basic point of view of a, a user, a daily user online, even though young people are digital natives, not all of them are aware of what their activity online means, what it implies. Uh, therefore, we engage with different things with different organizations such as the hate speech online, uh, with the Council of Europe and other things. Well, as uh, old Chinese saying uh, goes, a uh, long journey starts with the first step. And we made all of the first steps with the uh, summer school, with the ISOC, with ACP, with the youth forum. We cooperate, exchange ideas, exchange lectures. But I think we have to start running a bit and making second, third, and fourth, uh, fourth step a bit faster. And there are a few ideas on the table, like what I mentioned, internet uh, uh, MA in internet governance. And I'm sure that out of this discussion, we will find quite a few win-win opportunities to all partners and uh, make these next steps. Thank you. Um, I like Wolfgang's uh, point about sitting together and talking, and I think we should do that. I think the, the modality of, of parallel events like the youth forum or pre-events um, that some of us have at, at IGF is very important. I also am happy to say that, that my organization and uh, my colleague Tuwela or my friend Tuwela uh, in the audience from NEPAD are talking to the summer school uh, people about doing an African summer school next year. And then I'd also like us to remember that the working group on IGF improvements emphasize the role of the IGF. And I'd like to see something simple, like whenever anyone registers for the IGF, that one of the questions they fill in on that form is, a question that asks you, what do you really want to learn uh, about internet governance? So that we also have a more dynamic um, relationship with every IGF participant. Well, my, uh, my comment uh, will uh, take inspiration from the discussion that uh, have been around during the last days on uh, enhanced cooperation uh, amongst uh, organization, uh, within the organization, but uh, I think that for, uh, to promote capacity building, uh, we should have an enhanced cooperation amongst individuals. So I think that uh, the solution is to cooperate and, and uh, start a real dialogue amongst individuals. Thank you very much. Um, Vlada, do you have to add something to this conclusion from your side? Nothing to add, it's just to, to, be, to be happy to, to have a, a number of these, these small puzzles now together. And uh, we are going to go on with building up the big puzzle with merging the small ones when it comes to the various type of activities of capacity building, various topics covered, various levels of capacity building and so on. And we hope to have uh, a good database or a good overview all together soon that would be useful for, for everyone. So I, th I thank all the panelists and uh, my main conclusion is um, building relationships to run the marathon. And as we had such a great
uh, finalize uh, this rolling document which uh, compiles all the various capacity building provisions. It will then be provided to the IGF to feed into their uh, work and uh, to their needs. And maybe we can meet next year here again and, and find out uh, if we made progress in this regard and how we can improve the process. Thank you very much to this uh, expert uh, panel and also thank you to the very active audience.